Welcome, delicious friends. Um, if the trailer playing on a massive screen above our heads didn't tip you off already, this is the Sunless Sea Submariner panel. I am joined on stage by some lovely people from Fail Better Games. Could you please introduce yourselves and say what do you do? Uh, hello, I'm Paul Arendt. I'm the art director for Fail Better. Hi, I'm uh, Liam Walton. I'm the director of development. I don't have as nice a voice as Liam, but I'm Chris Gardner and I'm the narrative director. Excellent. So I guess to, to kick us off, give us the, the elevator pitch for Submariner. What is it and what is it doing to Sunless Sea? Uh, well, it's submarines, basically. Uh, so as well as sailing around on the surface and having a really horrible time being attacked by monsters and reading stories, you can now do that under the water as well with even more horrible monsters and grimmer stories. That's, that's the elevator pitch. Great. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. This is my floor. Um, more of it, but wetter. <laughs> Got it. So... <laughs> Um, one of the things we were, we were going to discuss, in fact, let's discuss it now, is the theme of trespass, which I'm told uh, is an important one for, for this expansion. Could you talk us through what that means, basically? Yeah, so um, you're not meant to be under the water. Uh, no one sensible chooses to go and live under the sunless sea. The top is bad enough, and only absolute lunatics think that they should go to the bottom of it and see what that's like. Um, and all the powers that rule the sea, so the London Empire, the Carnate, uh, have announced very persistently and repeatedly that there is nothing of interest beneath the sea and they are all lying. Uh, and underneath there are horrors and treasures and all sorts of wonderful things. It's essentially a game under the game, uh, which has made it quite hard to make. But, um, but yeah, we've got the sort of the same ocean that you have in the base game, but you can go under and see uh, how things look from a different angle. Yeah, one of the uh, kind of sorry, <laughs> one of one of the uh, one of the interesting things is one of the things that makes it so hostile is how uh, dark it is down there, how hard it is to find your way. But once you find things, there's actually like amazing, as Chris says, like treasures down there. Every time one of your captains dies in Sunless Sea, and if you've played it, you know that happens a lot. Uh, <laughs> they sink to the bottom of the ocean, and there's wrecks for you to go and explore, but they're just like dim lights in the distance. And it could be a wreck, or it could be something less friendly. This is actually, weirdly, it's one of the things we talked about when we very first started making the game, the base game, was the idea that somewhere off in the distance there's a light, uh, and you have a risk. Do you want to go and see what's behind that light? Is it going to be a wonderful treasure, or is it going to be the end of your game? And it's something we, we never quite got in the base game, but it literally happens in Submariner, because uh, most of the elements that you, can, uh, that you can explore under the sea have a phosphorescence to them. Uh, but that doesn't tell you what they are until you get closer. Um, so, uh, mechanically, how does it work in terms of... Uh, because you convert your ship into a submarine, right? It's not a separate ship that you need to get into. Um, how, does, how does that work in the game, gameplay-wise, I mean? Uh, there's a, a quest you have to do to unlock the ship conversion process. You have to invent it, basically, uh, in the game. Once you've done that, you only have to do that once, and then your future captains uh, can go and get the conversion done. Uh, we didn't want to make people do that over and over again. And then any time you're out at sea, you press the magic button, which I believe is Z. T. 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 I apologize. Top <laughs> I might have changed my key bindings. That's um, <laughs> bad. Uh, and you will, you will think you can dive anywhere uh, on the ocean. Yeah, at that point, uh, any ship can transform into a submarine. You don't need to have a specific ship to do it. And then you can dive for as long as your oxygen tanks hold out. Uh, so there's always this constant risk that you're going to suffocate at the bottom of the ocean because uh, we just thought the game was too easy. Yeah, I've, I, that certainly tallies with my experience. It's always just been a very sedate, safe-feeling sort of experience. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're finally cranking things up a notch. That's very nice. Thank you. So um, you, you already alluded that uh, there are some new ghastly beasties underneath the undersea. Can you tell us a bit about some of those and some of the new cities that are being added and basically what's, what's new that you can explore? Uh, shall I do cities? Do you want to do beasties? Or... Let's divvy it up. Okay. Um, I'll tell you about a couple. We've got... Uh, you've seen a glimpse of them in the trailer just now. Um, 
Hideaway, which is, I think, my personal favorite, which is a, a city that's built on the back of a giant sea creature. Um, and it's where you go when you can't go anywhere else. Uh, so it's full of exiles and outlaws, and it has this sort of complex backstory around it. Um, but it basically takes the whole uh, giant enemy crab thing to the extreme, because <laughs> it's a crab the size of a large town um, with a sort of huge amount of metalwork on it and so on. Chris can talk about what happens there, I think. Uh, I don't really want to give that away, but the, 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 that's, we can say that the beast is not dead, let's say that. Um, I think one of my favourites is Dayat, where uh, a society of drowned sailors have created their kind of ideal um, uh, reflection of a, a London that never was. Uh, and when you go there, you can, uh, it's, the, it's a city of delights and you can enjoy it and, and take pleasure in it, but it is all an illusion and it's your choice of whether you want to enjoy the illusion or peel the curtain back and see what's behind. I'm just, just a, a quick observation. People get eaten by other people a lot in Sunless Sea. Yeah, it happens. What, why, why are you so obsessed with cannibalism? Well, we weren't, but everyone, all the players were, and they really liked it, so we kept adding it in. It's just funny, <laughs> I think, when it comes right down to it. Um, it's funny and horrible and horrible and funny, and that's kind of really in the space where we like working. It's like the ultimate punchline. And then I ate them. <laughs> I mean, um, can we just actually have a quick show of hands? Who here has eaten another human being in Sunless Sea? I mean, I personally... In Sunless yeah. Sea. In Sunless, 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 Sunless Sea, that's an important <laughs> distinction to make. Okay, there's actually fewer people than I did see a hand go thought. down there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. No one's eaten another human at EGX, though, right? That's... <laughs> oh, one. Okay, not yet. Perfect, fine. Okay, um... So, um, what else is new gameplay-wise for, for Zamarina? What, what else can we take a look at? So, um, a lot of the creatures down there, uh, it being this really dark environment, gave us an opportunity to kind of spring surprises on players in a way that was slightly harder in uh, like the surface game. So, uh, we've got like lots of like like wriggling eels and there's this particularly horrible one that's like this big like just massive teeth that leaves this like greasy trail but yeah, that one these creatures right. uh you won't know of their presence until it's way too late like as i say you, you get right up next to them and then suddenly they just like burst out of the ground and you go ah <laughs> they do tend to lie in wait yeah Wow, okay. Um, so, obviously, you know, the, this is uh, the first expansion for Sunless Sea, correct? Yes. Uh, good. I didn't miss one. Um, how has it changed the base game? Uh, wh what kind of shape does it, does it take on now? Rather interestingly, I think it's, it just adds additional choices to uh, the base experience. Uh, often, uh, you'll be on your way to a city, uh, you'll be handing in a port report or something, and now you've got that choice of, okay, I'm returning to London, but do I want to go, do I want to sail over the sea? Do I want to risk being caught by that beastie I know tends to hang out around the island on the way? Or will I risk uh, a trip under the waves? Now, down there, there are, um, there are currents which can speed you along your way as long as you're going in the right direction to give you a bit of a boost to your speed. Uh, you might stop off and find that uh, there's like a crate of torpedoes that have been left on the bottom of the ocean that might just be a good way of you know, picking up a couple of extra resources. But it's always balanced against the risk that you're going to face something more terrifying down there. So it's not a choice that you make easily, but there's that additional choice like always present. That's one of the exciting things about making it something that people can do at any time in any location. The other thing is that there's a time limit, which is something that almost never happens on the surface. You've got an amount of time before you run out of oxygen. If you're lucky, you can, you'll find an oasis which will refill that. Or, uh, but generally, you'll have quite a short period of time to explore an area, see what's there, get out alive, um, and then get back to the surface and replenish your air before you all suffocate. So it's a sort of, it feels like a sort of smaller loop within the larger loop of the main game. So it's high risk, high reward, basically. Is yeah. A, is a thing. Okay, well, um, I'll tell you what, I think we are going to open things up to an audience Q&A in just a moment. But before then, uh, I believe you have a small announcement to make. I say a small announcement. I'm really excited about this.
Oh yeah, uh, so uh, I'm very proud to announce that our next game is going to be called, drum roll, Sunless Skies. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a sequel to Sunless Sea, set in space. Kinda. Kinda. <laughs> we took, we'd gone down with Submona and we thought, well, what directions are left? Uh, and uh, yeah, the sky's with the limit, so. It ain't your mama's space, though. This isn't like modern, a modern game uh, interpretation of space. It's not, you know, Newtonian. This is a much more of a, a Victorian conception of what space might have been, uh, filtered through the peculiarness of fallen London. Uh, so it's packed with stuff and horrors and, you know, much like some of the series. Got it. Oh, um, some of our inspirations are H.G. Wells, C.S. Lewis, uh, and, and the kind of genre of planetary romance, which has uh, flown under the radar for quite a long time, was sort of abandoned, and we'd like to explore again. So, uh, space cannibals, presumably? Probably. Maybe. Got it. We're still in development, you know. <laughs> sure, I mean, well, indeed, it, it, it's kind of, you're in the early stages right now, and I believe you're coming to Kickstarter next year? Yes, that's the plan. Beginning of February, we'll, we'll kickstart it, um, mm -hmm. and hopefully that'll go well. And then we're going to go to early access again, like we did with Sun and Sea, because uh, we thought that was great. We love open development. Um, we found the whole process of making a game with our community was just incredibly rewarding. Yeah, so, it's getting feedback at, uh, at that early stage is really great. The Kickstarter was great for that as well, just sort of get that first blush reaction uh, from from the community, just sort of go, oh yeah, that sounds really cool. Like, that's, that's really nice, and we desperately want to get that again. Also, I need another tattoo. <laughs> right, yeah, so just for anyone who doesn't know about this, can you just talk us through the whole stretch goal tattoo thing? So it, it didn't seem as if we were uh, going to meet, uh, well, we met our, we met our goal, um, and we were really excited about that, and then the next, like big uh, milestone that we had. We were pretty sure we were gonna fall just short of it. So I ransomed up a portion of my arm for a tattoo. Uh, and then someone changed, one of our backers changed their, uh, their pledge by about a grand and a half to, uh, yeah, thank you very much. But uh, now I do have uh, this, uh, Ooh. which is, you know, I don't hate it. <laughs> it's fine. Well, I mean, that's a good thing to be able to say about any tattoo, really. I, I mean, I have a few of them, and yeah, it's a good thing not to hate them. It's been pointed out to me for this one that I'm still virgin skin, so I may be uh, on the sacrificial table this time. Uh -oh. One of us. One of <laughs> us. <laughs> All right, well, I think if you guys are uh, comfortable, we're going to throw it out to uh, an audience Q&A. So there's going to be a microphone in a patch of light just over there. And, uh, well, here's the thing. What you're going to do is you're going to walk up to that microphone and then ask a question into it. Um, do not be afraid to queue up behind other people while they're asking their questions, because it means that we can eliminate minute-long awkward silences while people are sort of winding their way through the room. Is As you're boldly doing even now. Exactly. I mean, I, let's see how long I can just continue in one long, unbroken sentence because no one's coming up to the microphone. Somebody. There you go. There's a man standing Wee. up. Round of applause, please, for the one who came to the microphone. That light is very intimidating. Hello. 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 Uh, I've got to get really close to it. Um, what advice would you give to somebody? That's really weird. Sorry, I might hear it myself. Um, what advice would you give to somebody trying to get into games development? Um, more on the indie angle at the moment than because there's not a lot in the UK at the moment of the big companies. But uh, I think the best advice is make a game. Don't have to be a big one. Make something, finish it, get feedback on it, then make another one. Uh, it's like any of the, I mean, it's the same, same thing with film. The only way to do it is to do it. Uh, and the only way to be seen uh, and to sort of get your talent out there is having something that people can play. And luckily, that's easier than it ever was. Yeah, there's, uh, there's so many amazing uh, free tools out there for making games. And yeah, your first game is going to be probably not very good. And your second, and your third. And just, you've got to get that... on the guy, Liam. Come on. <laughs> uh, you've got to kind of... I think you've got to get it out of your system. Uh, you've got to escape the fear of uh, being judged and it not meeting your own personal expectations, uh, which is hard. Like, you always want to, 
to do like the best work you possibly can, but your work gets better the more you release and the more you show to people. And that's kind of one of the fundamental reasons we like open development. You get your work out there in front of people, uh, you get some honest feedback, and you improve upon it that way. And I think getting into the industry is the same. Just keep on plugging away uh, and show as much as you can to as many people as you can. And proving you can finish something is more important than showing you have ideas. There's no shortage of ideas, but people who can start something, finish something, and start something new, that's what we look for. Cool. Thanks very much. I'm slightly confused by how the oxygen mechanics will work, i.e., what's to stop me just pressing resurface and then diving again to refill oxygen? Good question. All right, it's me. Uh, so um, your oxygen uh, uh, refills on the surface, not instantly, uh, so there is a delay there. Um, so it's not like you can just quickly pop up and then immediately back down. Also, the process of turning a ship into a submarine takes time. Uh, As you'd expect. I mean, it's a big undertaking, turning a ship into a submarine. Makes a lovely noise. It's my favorite bit. Thank you. So yeah, there's, uh, you can refill fairly quickly, but um, the other thing is that while you are surfacing and while you are diving, you can't move and you are vulnerable. Uh, so it is possible to escape being attacked on the surface or under the water if you time it well, but it's also possible that you'll be sitting there getting eaten and never make it to the surface. All right, thanks. Hello. Hello. Hey, hey. Hiya. Um, I've never actually uh, played the game Sunless Seas, and I definitely plan on buying it when I get home. But I'm just a bit confused on how the eating people works. Because you get a knife and fork. Uh, <laughs> so you, uh, uh, you have a hunger bar, and it's constantly going down, and you've got supplies. And as long as you've got supplies, uh, the hunger bar will keep refilling. But when you run out of supplies, your options get narrower, and your first mate starts looking extra tasty. Uh, and you're going to have to make the decision, do you eat your first mate, or do you not make it back to London? And some people will choose the honourable route and go down with all hands, and some monsters, many of whom are in the audience, will eat the first mate and be damned. I think uh, it's one of our kind of approaches to uh, like survival mechanics uh, in, in the game. They're, they are loss conditions, like if you run out of fuel, that is a, that is a, that's a loss. If you starve, that's a loss. But on the way to those ultimate failures, you have choices which open up. So, yeah, you're starving, but it's not like you're starving and then that's the end. It's, you have to, there is a way to eke out uh, uh, like a, uh, an existence there, maybe just make it back just survive, but the choices that you have to make are, you know, terrible. <laughs> and uh, just one more thing. Um, if you were to, uh, for instance, go to London and eat somebody, would the people around them or their families be angry at you? There uh, oh, are... certainly, I think. Uh, probably. <laughs> um, there... I don't want to give too much away, but once you start down that path of eating people, there's... Uh, a whole set of stories that unlock. Uh, I wouldn't want to give them away. Okay. Thank you. Nope. Hello. Hello. Um, so, uh, Sunless Sea is extremely story rich and there's a ridiculous amount of interesting story to it. Can you talk a little bit about your process of coming up with stories and deciding what should stay, what should go? Um, so we start with a um, quite loose breakdown of uh, each of the story elements, like each of the ports, each of the officers that you can employ. Um, and then we'll write a, a, a brief and we'll pass that to one of our writers or a freelancer who will give us a pitch. Uh, and at that point we take that pitch and then we kick the living stuffing out of it um, and end up with something that's often quite different. Uh, than was originally uh, presented. Um, and then the writers will go away and work on that. And at each uh, point, they'll kind of turn in a certain amount of work and we'll take that opportunity to read up on it, 
suggest ways we can tie it in with other content that's being written or the underlying themes of the game like trespass uh, or mechanics that we want to make more use of. Uh, and then so we'll guide it uh, much as you will guide your ship back to London. Uh, we like to try and guide the content towards its, its final state. Thank you. Hi, I've uh, got two questions, if that's permissible. Uh, first of all, I absolutely loved the way that Sunless Sea and Fold in London basically wear their mechanics on the sleeve by showing you in the corner of everything, you know, this story lit is available because you have this and that and you don't have this. I presume, is that going to carry on with Sunless Skies? Yes, I think, yes, it will. Um, there's a few things that we want to be a little more reticent about. There's some, sometimes I think we give you too much information and, and, and some of it acts as chaff and obscures the really important bits. But um, uh, showing you those um, uh, story beats that show you something has changed and you know something about the world somewhere is going to be different is a, is a really strong um, part of how we work. Cool. It's also, we're going to retain that same sense that anything uh, you do, anything you own, any decision you made, any characteristic you have can affect the choices that are available to you. Because that's one of the really interesting things about the storylet system that we've, uh, we've, we've created is uh, any decision you've ever made can uh, have an impact. We will remember that <laughs> on everything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question, very minor. Sunless Skies, is it going to be set in the roof of the same cave that we're in all the time, or is it actually in space? Uh, it's set in a place called the High Wilderness, uh, which is a location you can actually uh, get to in Sunless Sea if you yes, really push it's, it. Yes, uh, it's a, a kind of hidden victory condition in Sunless Sea, yeah. Ah, oh, well, okay, so spoilers, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, it's not the roof of the Neath, it's... Um, I don't want to talk too much about this because there are a few surprises and we're still working out some of the details, but um, I think, imagine it as, it, it's about as like real space as Sunless Sea is like the real sea, so not very. Um, it's so a, there's, there's water, but sometimes the mountains try to eat you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So it'll be a sort of archipelagic kind of uh, sp um, game space. So there'll be lots of places to visit, uh, probably about the same kind of size. OK, thank you. And thank I'm you. prepared to give Thanks. some stuff away that Paul might not be. But the, uh, the, uh, the British Empire has, uh, uh, at least some of it, has uprooted and headed out to uh, the skies, where they're establishing a new empire, uh, which is somewhat less friendly uh, than the old one was. Uh, and it's about and that's saying something. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and it's about uh, carving out uh, a new em empire in this strange new frontier. The really early thinking on this was uh, we came, we, we started saying, "Oh, hey, Victorians in space," and clearly that's an absurd idea. Uh, but if you get past the idea that it's absurd and start thinking about what it would be like, uh, it's kind of terrifying because you know these guys were incredibly industrious not given to be morally scrupulous when they were colonizing. Um, and this is virgin territory. I mean, imagine, you know, um, uh, if Iceberg Kingdom Brunel was not constrained by gravity. Uh, that's the kind of world we're talking about. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Hello. That was, that was quite loud. Um, Quick question to each of you, really, uh, building on the sort of storyline question we had earlier. I have very distinct memories of going slightly insane in a post office at one point during some of the scene. What's the most iconic part of the storyline, as far as you're concerned, or, or your favorite, and why? For, for all three of you, or all four of you. Well, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, one of my, it's a really early one, actually, uh, where you, uh, it's a hard game to uh, make money in Sunless Sea, and you sail about for a bit, and you're selling stuff for pittance, and you're not earning very much, and then you go back to London, and this shady gentleman says, uh, oh, I've, uh, oh, I've got a little deal for you. 
oh, I, if you take some fuel, and as long as you, uh, you do a favour for me later on, then uh, we'll all be good. This is not how he needs to sound. This is just my head cannon. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, just like that uh, very early, like, deal with the devil, with the... Uh, that's, I've always loved that because you know immediately this is a bad idea, but you're already in like dire straits. And so you're just, every now when I start a new game, there's points where I just kind of go, oh, I've got to take it. I don't want to, but I've got to take it. And I love that. I think for me, it's where um, we have one quest where you arrive at an island and you have to settle a savage war that's been raging between two factions. Um, but what makes it singularly least under the sea is that one faction is rats and the other faction is guinea pigs. That's a very tough choice, that one. <laughs> um, I'm going to cheat and talk about the art because um, <laughs> the favourite bits for me are the stuff on the really far east of the map because we did basically make the game in that direction. We started with Fallen London and, and moved outwards. Um, which meant that I was a great deal more comfortable with what I was doing by the end of it. Um, so it gets steadily more crazy uh, as, as you go outwards. I think my favorite is the sea of statues with the, with the giant hands reaching out of the water, uh, which as it turned out was an enormous check that I then had to cash when we went to Submariner and we had to work out how that was going to look. Uh, but we've worked it out. Uh, mine was going to be the shady individual and always having to deal with the devil as well. So I'm going to say that I really, I just, I love the music when it strikes up, whenever you get in sight of Fallen London again, and you just, it's such a rousing theme, and you think, I'm probably safe, I might still die before I get there, and it's just great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, one of the things about Sunless Sea that's always interested me is that you've got these really small, well, often quite small bits of narrative, and then these enormous expanses where almost between the narrative. Um, how do you go about getting that pacing to work? Because it's so close that it could be incredibly dull, and it just never is. And how do you go about getting that to work and still keeping the player involved? Uh, we, during the de development, that was something that we spent a long time uh, tweaking. Uh, we changed the scale of the game uh, a couple of times. Uh, we uh, made sure that uh, the distances between islands felt like they were an appropriate length of time. Uh, we made sure that uh, creature encounters, we didn't ever want it to feel like you're just constantly dodging between enemies. It should always feel like a big event when you, when you encounter something. Uh, but um, it is supposed to be a game where you often feel sort of like isolated and lonely. And... Uh, there are a couple of, like, we set a lot of, like, ticking time bombs up to keep you occupied during those moments. Uh, obviously, all the survival mechanics, you've, you're constantly looking at your fuel, uh, your, uh, your crew. Uh, there's, there's always something in the background uh, keeping you, like, motivated. But there are still those moments of, like, silence, particularly when, I think my favourite are when just, like, the, the music stops and there's nothing on screen but ocean and it's not for very long because as you say it's, yeah. it's, it's, we make sure that it's not but you have this moment of just going oh, there's nothing there and it's kind of it's a sad moment and it's yeah it was we tuned it to make sure that we got that Loneliness was a big uh, guiding word for us right, right from the yeah. beginning. It was it wanted to make it a game about being sort of lost at the sea with no end in sight. Uh, and I think right back from Fallen London, we felt that the reason our approach to storytelling works uh, is because it's broken up, not in spite of it, uh, is that the player makes a journey between one little story and another, and that, that journey's theirs. We, we don't interfere with that at all. And I think you're... Um, experience of a story changes a lot when you are in the middle of it and when you've just completed it and then when 10 minutes have gone by and you've had time to process it and think about it and if you ask people what just happened at the first of those times and then after you can get quite different answers uh, so yeah we've been doing that we've been in London a lot as well 
Thank you. You look like someone who asked a question earlier. This is uncanny. Yes, it is. Um, I promise this is the last question, but I was just wondering about, because as you can probably tell, I'm a huge fan of Fallout 4 and the series itself. Is there a, a level up system and an upgrade system towards your ship, your crew, your player? Uh, yes, uh, your character levels up, your, you can buy different ships and you can slot different equipment, equipment into your ships uh, to level them up as well. And as you develop the different stories on the islands, the state of the islands change as well, which also uh, unlocks different possibilities. So you're kind of leveling up the world as you play as well. So as you, pro as you progressively get along, do you get better weapons or, yeah. Okay. yeah but uh, if you die, gone. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can sort of set some, uh, you can create a will and uh, make allowances should the worst happen and that will, uh, that will mean that your next captain uh, is stronger and better equipped than the one before it, but the penalties for death are, you know, pretty bad. And just one last thing. Uh -huh. Once I've completed a game, I like to start a new game and abuse by using the developer console. Is there one <laughs> in Sunless Seas? Uh, is there a developer? No. <laughs> no, there isn't, sorry. Uh, but we do, um, we've got uh, a pretty open approach to uh, modding. Like most of the files, you can dig in there and uh, there's, I think there'll be plenty, <laughs> plenty for you to abuse if you... Uh, if you went digging in our uh, like source files, so there's plenty there for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right, well, I think that's all we have time for. I'm sad to say I could quite easily keep this up for uh, hours. But um, anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this session. Uh, Sunless Skies looks really exciting. I can't wait to see more. Please do give a very warm round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.